Thank you, Chairman Jordan, for your leadership. The FBI has been victimized by political capture, and that politicization has manifested in the targeting of Americans who never deserve to have this government weaponized against them. Whistleblowers saw those bad acts. They stepped forward and they were retaliated against and crushed as a consequence. And our work today will build on the work of Special Counsel Durham, who said recently that at the FBI there is confirmation bias and over willingness to rely on information from individuals connected to political opponents and action without appropriate objectivity. Uh, there, uh, one of the whistleblowers we'll hear from today served in the United States Marine Corps, served as a local cop, Garrett O'Boyle, and uh, this is uh, his testimony regarding that political capture. Do you believe that the FBI has become political? I do. I think most people out in the field um, trying to avoid that politicization of of the agency, which I, which is good, but it's gotten to a point. It seems to me that uh, it's 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 like a cancerous point where the FBI has let itself become enveloped in this politicization and weaponization that. One group that saw that weaponization work against them were Catholics. The FBI field office in Richmond put out a memo saying that violent extremists would find the Catholic ideology attractive and would attempt to connect with Catholic adherents. That extremists uh, would show an interest in Catholic congregations over the next 12 to 24 months leading up to the presidential election. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? And the memo calls for the FBI to develop sources within Catholic congregations uh, to try to obtain information about those folks. Another group that saw weaponization turn against them, parents who attended school board meetings. Uh, you'll hear today from Steve Friend, who worked for the FBI and actually found himself ridiculed at his own FBI office because he, too, was a parent who attended a school board meeting. This is Steve Friend. Given your law enforcement background, does knowing that you could be investigated by the FBI for speaking up at your child's school board meeting chill parents from exercising their First Amendment rights? Yes. And you said you had attended a school board meeting and you were nervous that you could be under federal investigation. Is that correct? Yes, my colleagues teased me about it. Americans who were in Washington, D.C. on January 6th who committed no crimes, who simply attended a rally, also saw the FBI weaponized against them. George Hill was an FBI uh, employee working out of the Boston field office, and he talks about the pressure that the Washington field office was putting on Boston, and when they tried to get predicate evidence, they couldn't get it for a very interesting reason. This is George Hill. Joe Bonavolante said, no, we're not opening up cases on people who went to a rally. And I forgot a few cards. The SSA for CT2 said, happy to do it, show us where they were inside the Capitol, and we'll look into it. To which WFO said, we can't show you those videos unless you can tell us the exact time and place those individuals were inside the Capitol. To which the SSA responded back, and I was privy to these conversations firsthand, why can't you show us, why can't you just send us, back, give us access to the 11,000 hours of video of this event? Because there may be, may be, UCs, undercover officers, or CHS's confidential human, or confidential human sources on those videos whose identity we need to protect. Marcus Allen, an FBI analyst who did work around evidence, sharing it with folks, he saw videos that concerned him about the federal government's own involvement in January 6. Here's Marcus Allen. Video to me indicated uh, uh, potential problems uh, with the uh, investigation as far as informants uh, were concerned and uh, our organization's uh, potential forthrightness about utilization of informants there on that day that might have some impact on our cases um, and the you know the subjects that we were looking up and then just a general awareness overall for the investigation as a whole that there might have been some kind of uh, potential federal involvement with the activities on January 6th and I thought it was important enough that it like wanted our attention. 
so much of the good work happening at the FBI is throughout this country, and a lot of the rot the committee has learned emerges out of headquarters and out of the Washington field office. Garrett O'Boyle described the conflict that existed as the Washington field office put pressure on other field offices around the country to engage in law enforcement work without predication. This is Mr. O'Boyle. I would say they pressured um, pressured us to open cases uh, to some degree. Um, one example that I have personally, I, I made this, this is one of my protective disclosures, so I'll just touch on it a little bit. But um, I received a lead about someone based on an anonymous tip and in law enforcement, anonymous tips don't hold very much weight, especially without evidence that you can corroborate uh, pretty easily. I wasn't able to corroborate anything they said. Um, even after speaking with uh, the person, they allege potential criminal behavior of them. While I'm trying to figure all that out, I get another lead from the same agent who sent me that lead. And um, they, they essentially tried to get me to violate policy or law trying to get people to break the law without sufficient predication is a weaponization of our government and all Americans suffer when resources are misallocated when stats are padded following 9-11 the FBI set up all of these terrorism entities to look outward at people abroad who might seek to harm our country but a lot of those authorities were turned inward against our own people and the result was stat padding for the purpose of FBI officials trying to convince Congress that the violent extremism threat was more enhanced than it indeed was, and we got critical testimony on that point also from Mr. O'Boyle. As a DT agent, I encountered similar um, stat padding or case bolstering. Truth be told, it was one case, like, but the FBI had me open up four different cases uh, because they had me open a case for every individual that I had a um, articulable factual basis that there may have been um, potential federal law being violated. Or like on a criminal case, say you're working like a gang, which is, this case was, I guess, like a militia. Um, if you're working like a gang, you have a case open on a gang, and you have a subfile for each person in it. Like, if, you, know, you know, John Doe 1, 2, and 3, they would all have their own subfile. Or in my case, John Doe 1, 2, 3, and 4 all had their own separate case because then the FBI could, from my perspective, the FBI could come back to Congress and say, look at all the domestic terrorism we've investigated. But really, I was working one case. But the FBI can then say, well, he actually had four. So we, you know, we need to give us more money because look at how big of a threat all this domestic terrorism is. Padding the stats to try to showcase a problem that is overemphasized political capture and political infection of our law enforcement. These brave patriots spoke up about it. They'll be testifying to our committee today, and my colleagues will now discuss some of the intense and depraved retaliation that they had to experience, and I'd recognize my colleague from Florida, Kat Kamek, to share some of those thoughts with us.